All right, let's get into section number seven. Uh, this is a design case study activity. We're gonna be designing an enterprise network with BGP and internet connectivity. The goal of this particular design activity is to learn how to consider uh, customer requirements and how to design a BGP network that is based on those particular requirements. So uh, here's kind of a description of what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, Pile Forensic Accounting has hired you to design a network expansion. The customer is a large enterprise which recently expanded to multiple worldwide markets. The new network expansion will span over multiple countries and regions. Internet access will also need to be redesigned to allow the overseas branches to use the local internet breakout if uh, it is more economical to do so. The cost of the WAN links in that interconnect the different regions can be very high, so the network should be designed to accommodate strict policies on conditions in which some of those links will be preferred over the others. Very similar to what we talked about at the end of section number six, right? So we have our NA, our North America Regional Center number one with various branches running OSPF, North America Regional Center two with various branches running OSPF, uh, our North America main headquarters with various branching, uh, with various branches, and then our European uh, regional centers and our Asian regional centers with branches as well. Okay, so the proposed topology per the customer requirements is to have 10 gig connections interconnecting our North uh, America uh, regional and main headquarters and one gig connections going to the European uh, headquarters, 100 meg connections between Asia and Europe, as well as an internet overlay or a separate internet network that allows us to communicate between our main headquarters and our regional offices in uh, Europe and Asia. Okay, so the customer has indicated that the data center that is situated at the current company headquarters will not be able to sustain the traffic from the new markets. So the customer wishes to build another data center abroad. This new data center will need to be deployed in Europe and communication between the two data centers will have to be established. All branches, regardless of their location, will have, uh, will, will have uh, access to services that are located at the headquarters data center. Uh, not sure that's supposed to be, will have to have. Uh, Pile Forensic Accounting has three regional centers, one in North America, uh, one in Europe, and one in Asia. Each regional center connects to several small branches on their own. Those small branches that are connected to the regional centers will only require default routing to the regional center. The regional centers already have an IGP running in their respective networks. We saw that was listed as OSPF. Um, the three North American sites run OSPF, European and Asian sites run EIGRP. Uh, the following link requirements have been sent to the customer. Uh, the North American regional centers and the main headquarters should form a triangle between them with a 10 gig connection. Uh, the link between RC2 and the main headquarters should be 100 megabits per second. Uh, the traffic from RC2 should use the faster link when communicating with the rest of the network. The main headquarters will connect to the European regional centers and Asia regional center with a one gigabit per second link. And the European and Asian regional centers, uh, Asian regional centers will be connected with a hundred megabit per second link. The customer has strict requirements regarding how different regional centers should access different services with regards to their location. Before we apply our policy, we will have to devise a means of tagging the corporate routes and the internet sourced routes with different tags. Europe and Asia devices should communicate via the main headquarters and the link between Europe and Asia will be only used as a backup which makes sense because we have one gig connections going through the headquarters location and we only have a hundred meg connection directly connecting Europe and Asia. Uh, also the North American RC2 devices and the Asian HQ devices should not be allowed to communicate. So in that particular case, I'm already thinking of communities. 
implementing BGP communities, and I'm also thinking about implementing the no export option for some of the prefixes that are being learned and shared across those sites. Internet access should be implemented in several different regional centers as follows. The main headquarters should be multi-homed with two independent local internet service providers, meaning that we'll have two routers at the headquarters location being uh, multi-homed to two separate ISPs. Uh, the European Regional Center will be a single-homed single connection using a private ASN, and the Asian Regional Center will be a single home using a private ASN. So in the case of our headquarters location, most likely we're going to use provider independent addressing. We're going to basically become the service provider for that address space, and at the Asia and uh, European Regional Centers, we're going to use provider uh, uh uh, provided addresses or provider assigned addresses uh, because we are using a private ASN. If we're using a private ASN, we can't act as our own service provider. The customer requires that the clients at the North American regional centers and the main headquarters primary access to the internet is through the main headquarters. The main headquarters ISP1 connection should be active for all traffic and the connection should, uh, uh, to ISP2 should be active only if ISP1 fails. We can achieve that goal in a couple of different ways. We've already seen multiple ways, but local preference is probably going to be the best option. Um, and, uh, and then to influence how the ISPs route back to us, we can do ASPath prepending for the uh, uh, prefixes, the provider independent prefixes that we're advertising to the ISPs from within inside the headquarters location. I'm assuming that we're going to kind of go through all this as part of the case study, but I'm just kind of thinking about these things as I'm reading the, the case study itself, thinking about, okay, how can I accomplish this goal? How could I accomplish that goal? The North American Regional Center should have, uh, receive only a default route to, uh, to be able to reach the internet. Okay, so that's... Uh, we're not doing any prefix uh, exchange between the ISPs, so we're not we're not uh, concerned about routing uh, specific prefixes to ISP one and specific prefixes to ISP two. So that makes our outbound routing scenario a little bit easier to digest. However, if the internet connectivity completely fails at the main headquarters, the internet traffic from North America should be routed via the remaining European and Asia internet links in order of priority. First, the European link, and then the Asian link. At every internet exit point, there will be NAT to, to the respective public IP range. Uh, regional centers will announce their own prefixes only to the internet. So European and Asian regional centers should use their own internet breakout and serve each other as a backup path for internet traffic if there is a local failure, meaning that they each have their own internet connections to their own local ISPs, but Asia should back up Europe and Europe should back up Asia. Uh, most likely that would end up going over that 100 meg link. We could send it through the headquarters location uh, so we can have kind of this nested scenario of, of failures that could occur. So, uh, you know, if the internet connection in Europe fails, maybe we'll route that internet connection or internet traffic through HQ over the one gig link and back over to Asia to go out the internet connection there. Um, it's kind of hard to, to follow along with these uh, details here uh, because there are so many things that are happening here, but we're going to break down each of these tasks as we go through the case study. Okay, so number one, we have to turn, determine the routing protocol, and I think pretty much uh, uh, BGP is, is going to be the routing protocol of choice. We've got multiple autonomous systems connected via the internet, a lot of policy decisions that we have to make based on routing. BGP is probably going to be the best number. What are the autonomous system numbers that we're going to use? Uh, what, uh, where are the peering relationships going to be established? Uh, how are we going to establish the BGP communities? We know we're going to have at least one set of no export communities and uh, potentially some other uh, custom communities or customer defined communities that we'll use to drive, uh, to drive our policy. Uh, we're going to define the routing policy for the North American site, for the European and Asian sites. Uh, how are we going to segment the internet connectivity? 
What is the, how is the uh, main headquarters multi-homing going to be configured? How are we going to do default routing? And then finally, we'll take a look at the final design. So step number one, determine the routing protocol. In this task, we're analyzing the routing protocol choices. Are we going to run OSPF, EIGRP, EIGRP and OSPF, or BGP on top of an IGP? The use of an exterior gateway protocol, not the EGP protocol specifically, but the generic exterior gateway protocol is definitely warranted because of how of all the requirements. I mean, even just the internet connectivity requirements, a one site failing over to another site or having a multi-homed connection at the headquarters site, that is definitely conducive to running BGP. Uh, so we have all these different islands of IGP running uh, EIGRP on the European and Asian sites and, and OSPF on the headquarters sites. Uh, but we do expect the network to grow. Uh, it is a global network. Uh, we have very strict policy requirements for routing. So the use of BGP is definitely the clear choice in this particular case. Uh, it would take a lot of effort to merge the networks into a single IGP domain. Uh, and uh, BGP does provide, even if we could, merge the networks into a single IGP domain. BGP provides a much better option because of all the policy restrictions that we have in place on you know, primary routing functions and secondary routing and functions and so on. Uh, we would have to do complex redistribution. We would have to do route filtering. We would have to set up a lot of policy-based routing, uh, service level agreements, uh, IPSLA, all kinds of things in order to get an IGP to do what we want it to do. All right. So the choice is to run BGP on top of our existing uh, IGP architecture. The next step is to determine the autonomous system numbers. In this task, you're going to learn how to choose the autonomous system numbers for the headquarters and the European Regional Center and the Asian Regional Center. How many autonomous system numbers do we need? I'm guessing three in this particular case uh, because we have, uh, well, it depends, right? Remember the, the headquarters has a couple of regional centers as well as the main headquarters location. I'm thinking we're gonna put all of those in one autonomous system, but they could be separated, but certainly we'll have a separate autonomous system for Europe and Asia. Uh, do we include the North American regional centers as one BGP AS or as three separate AS? Do we have any special policies that we need to apply between those centers? Uh, will you use BGP at the branch locations? Okay. Uh, the design they're saying here will consist of five different AS numbers. If the customer adds more regional centers in the future, more AS numbers may be needed. Each regional center should use a different AS number because this allows us to control in essence, how connectivity takes place, okay? Um, we didn't really, they didn't really mention, I mean, we did say that we're gonna have 10 gig connections between the regional centers and the main headquarters, um, and that's gonna be a full mesh, meaning that they're all gonna be connected to each other. Uh, so for that reason, we may have to decide to route uh, through one regional center to reach the headquarters or a different regional center to reach the headquarters or uh, you know, we may just have to decide uh, different routing. And, and quite frankly, if we're designing for scalability and we're defining and we're designing for administrative control, uh, creating those separate autonomous systems is going to provide that ability right from the beginning. Uh, and we wouldn't have to kind of redesign the network in the future when we find out we want that kind of kind of control. All right. So now we need to define the BGP sessions. We're gonna analyze the eBGP and iBGP session requirements for the autonomous systems. Where will we establish eBGP sessions? Where do we need to establish iBGP sessions? Uh, obviously, in this case, the eBGP sessions are gonna be between autonomous systems and the iBGP sessions are gonna be inside the autonomous systems. Do we need route reflectors? I don't know that we know whether or not we will or not. Um, it really would depend on what the internal autonomous system architecture looks like, whether or not we're gonna use one of those ASs as a transit AS, 
uh, you know, to, to, to reach a destination. For example, if RC1 is going to go directly to HQ to get out and never use RC2 as a transit AS, there may not be a high need to have IBGP peering relationships within the autonomous system itself. Uh, I'm assuming for redundancy purposes that we're going to go ahead and create that full mesh so that we can we have uh, options to route either directly to headquarters uh, to reach the other destinations or to go through another uh, regional center to, to get to those destinations. So it says here we should implement IBGP sessions within every AS between all of the routers in a full mesh. If we do use route reflectors, we would need to implement IBGP between all the clients and the route reflectors. IBGP is used internally only, and then our eBGP sessions are used to establish uh, sessions or peering relationships between the edge routers that belong to different autonomous systems. So we're gonna have one eBGP session directly connected uh, between the directly connected regional centers, and we'll also have eBGP sessions between the headquarters and the European location, as well as the Asian location. Route reflectors could be used. We understand now what the route reflector concept is, uh, and that would just depend on the density of routers that we have within the autonomous system. What benefits are we gonna gain from having the route reflector configuration? I would say uh, to uh, possibly avoid uh, route reflector configurations if at all possible. Um, you know, if we only have two or three routers inside of an autonomous system, there's no real benefit to adding the route reflector configuration. It just uh, just makes the, uh, the configuration more complex. However, uh, if we're planning for future use, future scalability, future design, uh, putting the route reflectors in place now, uh, understanding that we may be adding multiple routers in the future, and having lots and lots of uh, possible peering relationships that have to be established, we might decide to go ahead and put the route reflectors in place now, uh, uh, even though we may not need them now because we're planning for that future growth, okay? So we'll posi uh, position the route reflectors centrally in the path of the control traffic. The regional senders might not need to use route reflectors, but they could use them in the future. So you could, you could implement them now knowing that you're going to potentially have to implement them in the future. All right. Or at least make use of them in more capacity in the future anyway. Now we need to define our BGP communities. We're going to analyze the BGP community assignment for internally and externally received routes from the ISPs to apply appropriate policies. What are those policies going to be? Well, we went through a whole list. Right, we, we went through a whole list of requirements. I'd have to go back and review that list. Just reading it one time uh, didn't really kind of solidify it in my mind, but uh, I'm assuming we'll break out what those, those uh, requirements were in the solution as well. So how will we tag our enterprise routes? Are we gonna do this on a per location-based tag? How will we tag the routes that are received from the internet? Uh, we're only gonna be receiving a default route but we do have some priorities that we have to apply. So maybe based on the tags that we're receiving, you know, we're receiving a default route, we're applying a tag, uh, and then based on that tag, we're making a policy decision. I would say that's probably less important in this case because we're only receiving a default route. We can use other methods for ensuring that the appropriate default route is going to be the path that we're gonna use. Local preference or AS path prepending, Stuff like that is probably going to be the best option. The communities that will be used for tagging routes to apply policies at, very point, uh, at various points in our networks are going to have to be defined. We need to create a scheme that will clearly mark routes that are originated by your enterprise as opposed to routes that are received from the Internet. So the community scheme that they're suggesting would be in the form of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, colon, 12345, of course, being our um, uh, AS, uh, colon RC underscore AS. By this logic, all routes that are originated by AS12345 will be tagged as 12345, colon 12345. 
uh, all routes that are originated by AS65001 will be tagged as 12345-65001 and so on. Routes that are received from the internet will be tagged as the ISP's AS colon zero. Uh, again, this is somewhat arbitrary, right? Uh, how you decide to tag your routes uh, so that you can identify them within the policy really depends on uh, the, the, the designations that you want to use to distinguish those particular routes. Uh, this particular tagging method is a little bit different than, than what uh, we generally would do because they're using the AS for the second half of the uh, tag as opposed to the first half. Uh, typically, we'd use the AS for the first half, but and then the second half would be reserved for identifying a specific you know, building or a specific site or whatever within that particular region. All right, so in this task, we need to analyze the routing policy for the North American sites. Steer uh, traffic across the 10 gig links between RC2 and HQ. So clearly we're not gonna wanna use the 100 meg link. We're gonna wanna use RC1 as a transit AS uh, and uh, use that path. Uh, obviously, for the ingress and egress direction, if I was using the AS path attribute, uh, it would use the 100 meg link unless I'm doing AS path prepending to change that attribute. Uh, and we only have a single router leaving the area, leaving the autonomous system. So in that case, I'm thinking immediately about the weight attribute uh, to leave the system. But we also want to make sure that we're following the same path in the same direction or using the same links coming in the opposite direction. So HQ would have to make a similar decision. Now the question is, do we want to derive that policy from one location or do we want to uh, configure that policy locally at each autonomous system? Uh, being that we own this entire network, it might be easier just to simply apply the policy on the individual routers and let those individual routers make their own decision as opposed to trying to influence the policy decision from a different location. So uh, let's talk about the second one first. <clears throat> for HQ, per, for example, I could use, uh, I could use uh, the weight attribute to decide how I'm gonna route to the prefixes in, in, in RC2, applying a higher weight value to the 10 gig link as opposed to the 100 meg link. Uh, I could also do AS path prepending uh, with the idea that I'm influencing how RC2 would end up coming back to the HQ site, assuming that weights and local preference and whatnot are the same at the RC2 location, which means that I could control essentially both directions of traffic flow by using attributes that are imposed either inbound or outbound at the HQ location. The other option would be to just say, let me go ahead and allow each router locally to make a decision. So I could use the weight attribute at the HQ location to decide how I'm going to leave that particular autonomous system for destination prefixes in RC2. And then I could use the weight attribute at the RC2 location to decide how I'm gonna reach prefixes in HQ and, and beyond HQ, all right? Uh, it really depends on you know, what your, what your overall objective is. Uh, you might say, well, you know what? I don't want to have a bunch of different attributes that I'm using to make a policy decision. I want to decide on one attribute, uh, and then based on that attribute, I'm making a policy decision. So is that going to be uh, weight locally configured at each of the routers, or is it going to be some sort of centrally managed function uh, where we do AS path manipulation? You have to force traffic from RC2 to HQ through the 10 gig link. You can achieve this desired effect in several ways. If you influence the policy at HQ, then you would configure the HQ router facing RC1 and RC2 in the following ways. Assign a higher local preference to routes that originate at the RC2 AS uh, that are received by the RC1 peer. Um, uh, I don't agree with that. Based on the physical topology, local preference, remember local preference is if I have 
a, a, a dual homed configuration or multi homed configuration. Uh, we have a single router with two links and I have to decide, am I going to use the top link or the bottom link? So in that particular case, the weight attribute would be the attribute that I would use, not local preference. I mean, I could use local preference if I want to influence. Um, well, no, I really wouldn't use local preference. I was going to say I could use local preference if I want to influence how the other routers in HQ leave the autonomous system, but there's only one way to leave that autonomous system. So uh, in this case, I would say not to use local preference, but I would say use weight instead. Uh, and then the second option I do agree with, prepend the AS path two times for all the prefixes when we're sending them to RC2 directly, right? Because the AS path uh, on the top would be um, basically two hops, right? The AS for RC1 and then the AS for HQ. Uh, and if I go in the opposite direction, it would be one hop. Uh, and then if I prepend that additional, uh, the headquarters AS additionally twice, that would make it three hops, which, which would make it less preferred. And that's what I talked about. If we want to control this policy from one location, that's how we would do it. If we want to apply the policy at RC2 for all the routes that are received from RC1, we could do the same thing, right? Just in the opposite direction. Again, I would probably use weight and not local preference. Uh, and I would pre prepend the AS path twice for the routes that I'm receiving from the HQ router. We could also split the difference and kind of do it half and half where, uh, where we do weight on both sides and, and but, uh, that's probably not the best option. Our next task is defining the routing policy in our European and Asian sites. We're going to analyze the routing policy. What is the preferred path via the main HQ? Which path is going to be preferred by default and why? Which tools should we use and where? How will the policy change if we wanted to load share between the two paths? All right. So we're saying here that the uh, between Europe and Asia, the preferred path should be the 10 gig link. Uh, all the prefixes should be advertised through HQ over to Asia. Or do we want to make use of all of the links? You know, send some traffic over the link, the 100 meg link that directly connects RC and uh, Asia RC and European RC, and also use the 10 gig links. Again, this is going to be based on all of those policies that we configure, you know, whatever the policies might be, um, you know, and, and we're going to manipulate uh, these attributes by using route maps and apply communities and, and uh, make decisions based on communities or not. We can just simply make decisions based on prefixes. Uh, how will we restrict communication between North America RC2 and Asia RC, uh, including their branches? Well, that would be definitely something where we would use a BGP policy for that. Uh, we can do it a couple of different ways. We could do a no export. We could use prefix lists and filters uh, to filter reachability uh, if we just simply don't want those prefixes to be included. Uh, there's always a couple of ways that you can do stuff in BGP. Um, and not one way may not be better than the other or more preferred over the other. It just may be your own personal preference. The easiest way to influence this behavior is to influence the policy at the direct peering point between Europe and Asia regional centers. To achieve this objective, we have to make the direct path seem more distant than the path via the main headquarters. Uh, we can achieve this behavior with AS path prepending for the European regional center on the router that is peering with the Asian regional center. We can prepend the local AS two times for all the routes that originated by the local AS. And we would do a similar configuration in the opposite direction. We could use communities to match the locally originated prefixes for the AS path prepending. We can also use an AS path access list to do the same thing uh, if we wanted to. Again, there's lots of different ways that you can do this. Um, it just really depends on 
what you're comfortable with and, and how much control a particular method gives you. To load share between the direct path and the headquarters path, we should selectively prepend the AS path on the Asian and European location. We could choose half of the local prefixes um, that we want uh, that we will do the AS pre, uh, path prepending and leave the other half unchanged. In that case, we would use an AS path prepending access list to do that. The traffic for the prepended prefixes will go through the main headquarters while the traffic for the unchanged prefixes will go directly between the regional centers. Again, that is a, a decision that we have to make based on what we consider to be the, the types of traffic loads that we might see for that traffic. The BGP does is a policy-based routing protocol. So it's going to do whatever you tell it to do. It doesn't consider bandwidth or delay. It doesn't consider the amount of of traffic that's being generated to decide how it's going to perform load balancing. It's going to do load sharing based on the policy that you implement. Uh, so you would have to identify a percentage of the traffic. Obviously, the, the, the one gig links are going to be able to support more traffic than the 100 meg link. So we'd have to kind of evaluate that and decide how we're going to apply that. Okay. In this task, we need to analyze the routing protocol choices for the consolidated topology. What type of public address space to access the internet will we require for our headquarters? Uh, are we gonna use provider independent addressing, meaning that it's public addressing with a public ASN, and we're essentially the service provider for that public uh, provider independent address space, or is it gonna be provider assigned address space? Can we use provider independent address space everywhere? Uh, what would change your mind uh, about the European and Asian RC uh, IP type selection? Well, first of all, they told us that we're going to be using private ASNs for European and Asia. So in that case, that already makes our decision for us. Uh, we can't use provider independent address space if we're using private ASNs. For internet traffic, we will use NAT at every exit point. At the main headquarters, we will have two connections to two different ISPs, so we will have we uh, so you will have to request and use the PI range of IP addresses. That's pretty typical, by the way. Uh, if we have a multi-homed scenario, almost always you're going to be using provider independent address space, and they're either going to be statically routing to that provider independent address space or you're going to be sharing that, that routing information with them in some form or fashion. All right, for the European and Asian regional centers, we can use the uh, provider assigned IP address range. We could also use the provider independent range at those centers if you're ready uh, in the future to do multi-homing or whatever, connecting to another ISP, you could plan for that. But you will also require a public ASN, and we already mentioned that the ASNs for those locations are going to be private. Okay. Determine the main headquarters multi-homing scenario. In this task, you're going to analyze the multi-homing design considerations for the main headquarters. The customer requires ISP1 to be the primary ISP. Uh, where do we use local preference? Uh, where will you use local preference? And where will AS path prepending come into play? We will use local preference to leave the autonomous system. We will use AS path prepending to come back into the autonomous system. So AS path prepending is always preferred over MED to influence uh, as an outbound policy to influence inbound routing. Uh, and local preference would be preferred uh, as an inbound policy to affect outbound routing. Uh, so for the default route that I'm learning from ISP1, I would assign it a higher local preference uh, that would get propagated throughout my, my autonomous system. Uh, and then for the routes, the provider independent address space that I'm advertising to the ISP, I would uh, do AS path prepending on the bottom link to ISP2 to make that path less preferred for that provider independent address space. Would you consider, consider any other tools? Um, I would say no in this case. 
Uh, you could use multi-exit discriminator, uh, but you would have to have some sort of peering relationship with your provider that says that they're going to honor that med value. They're more likely to honor the AS path value than the med value. Uh, for outbound, we really don't have any other choices. Local preference would be the only choice. Um, uh, will you announce, uh, what will you announce to the ISP? What should you never announce? Uh, well, we should announce our provider independent address space uh, because we're the service provider for that public domain. But we should never announce the default route back so that if I'm getting a default route from ISP1, I should never announce it to ISP2 uh, for fear that we might become a transit AS. Or if those service providers are sending us uh, service provider specific prefixes for you know, kind of more efficient routing reasons, we wouldn't want to advertise those more specific prefixes to the other ISP as well. Don't forget to consider the policy in both directions. That's very important, right? We, we, we want to make sure that we're using a symmetric routing process. So whatever we're doing to influence how traffic leaves the network, we need to make sure that we're doing the same thing to influence how traffic enters the network. To make ISP1 a better path as an exit point from your network, you should assign a better local preference for all the prefixes that are received from ISP1. Now, in this case, we're only getting the default route, but it still applies to the default route. And we do have a multi-homed, uh, dual multi-homed scenario here. So we local preference would in fact be applicable in this case because we have multiple routers that have an IBGP peering session between them. The design ensures that all of the traffic that leaves the AS through ISP1 is sent uh, via ISP2 only if ISP1 fails, okay? For incoming traffic, the mechanism is different. We will prepend the AS path to my provider independent address space several times when announcing that path or that, that uh, address space to ISP2. We can never control how traffic enters our AS. We can only suggest how traffic should enter the AS, but it's more likely that AS path is gonna be an attribute that the provider is gonna use by default as opposed to MED. You certainly could use MED, but uh, MED, would only work in the case of, because it's an optional non-transitive attribute, MED would only work in the case where you're going to the same provider because that MED attribute would have to be something that we're evaluating within the same autonomous system. So in this particular case, because we have separate service providers, MED would not even be a value that we could use because it's an optional non-transitive attribute. So we're gonna announce our private uh, provider independent address space only to both ISPs. Uh, we filter everything else. Uh, we wanna make sure that we do not become a transit AS. That's an important concept. All right. Our next task is to determine the default routing. Uh, the default routing scenario was a little bit more complicated in this case, right? Uh, I think that was probably the most confusing part. Um, but uh, uh, we're going to analyze the routing protocol choices for the topology. How will we prioritize different default routes from three different sources in each location, right? Because we have internet connectivity at each of the locations, the North American location, European and Asian locations. Uh, will we prefer the closest exit? Which BP, BGP mechanism can we use? which points are the best suited to enforce this policy. Uh, again, this can be accomplished in a couple of different ways. Uh, communities would be a good way because community attributes are transitive. They are optional, but they are transitive. Uh, and we are talking about sharing information with ourselves, not an ISP or some sort of third party that may or may not accept that community information. Um, and uh, so that would probably be the best option, uh, but we could certainly apply AS path attributes to the default routing. Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated when, you're, when you have multiple entry and exit points. Uh, so I think communities would be the best option here. What will North America RC1 and RC2 use for uh, their default routing? You will receive a default route through three sources in your enterprise network, the main headquarters, the European Regional Center, 
and the Asian Regional Center. You will use the community tags that are assigned to the different default routes and then use that to apply the BGP policy. Uh, and that's, that's actually highly recommended in this case because the community tags are transitive attributes. They will move from one autonomous system number to the other, uh, which means that we can all kind of have a congruent uh, policy decision based on those tags. Each region will set the highest local preference to its own default route prefix, and then lower ones for the next one in line with the lowest local preference to the least desirable default route. Uh, and because it's the same route, right, it's a default route in all three cases, without tagging it, it would be difficult to differentiate uh, that default route. Now we could use a, 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 a um, route map that's applied to a neighbor relationship uh, and assuming that that neighbor is the only one that's originating that particular default route for that region, we could do that, but uh, we would not really have a central policy in that case. We would have to apply those policies independently at each locations, uh, each of the locations. Local preference will be set at the ISP edge when receiving uh, zero slash zero, it will be assigned the highest local preference. Zero slash zero meaning the default route. The routers on the edge of the ASNs will assign local preferences to the routes that come from other ASNs and will set the local preference accordingly. But as a rule, it will be lower than that of the local default route. RC1 and RC2 will receive and use whatever uh, default route is preferred at the main headquarters location for that moment. In any case, the routers will always send traffic to the main headquarters because there's no direct way to access the internet locally. Okay. Um, I'm not sure why they said that last part because we're getting a default route from ISP3 in Europe. We're getting a default route from ISP4 uh, and we can see that the, the local default route is preferred. Then it looks like in the case of Asia, the European default route is preferred. And then finally, the headquarters default route is preferred. So that last statement they made kind of seems to contradict that, that statement there. So what is our final design? Here is the final design showing the decisions that we've made in these steps. Let me kind of zoom out a little bit here. It's not going to let me. Uh, we'll look at the top part first, I guess. Uh, let's see here. All right. So uh, for Europe, uh, the uh, AS, not the SAS, but the AS is 65003. We're running IBGP full mesh. Uh, or route reflectors in uh, that area. Uh, we have provider assigned address space. Uh, we have an eBGP peering relationship with ISP3. Uh, in Asia, uh, similar configuration. In the headquarters, we have three different autonomous system numbers, AS12345 for the main headquarter location, which is a public AS. Uh, AS 65001 and 65002, which are private ASs. So those are going to have provider independent or so provider independent address space for HQ uh, and uh, and then provider assigned address space for uh, the, the uh, two branch locations. All right. Uh, as far as our communities go, the internal routes are going to be tagged with 1234 uh, AS. Um, uh, and the AS, so in the case of HQ, 1234, colon, 1234. Um, I see why they did that, because uh, the private ASs that exist on RC1 and RC2 are kind of subordinate to the primary headquarters autonomous system that goes to the service provider and the other branch locations. External routes from ISP1 are going to be assigned with the ISP AS, colon, zero, because it's only the default route. ISP2, ISP2, AS colon zero, three AS, uh, ISP3, AS colon zero, and four, ISP4 um, colon zero. 
We're going to do ASPath prepend, prepend uh, for the local prefixes. Uh, I, let me go from the left to the right here. We're going to assign local preferences for all prefixes received from RC1 uh, to 200. And we're going to uh, do AS uh, by the default. The default is 100, if you recall. So assigning a 200 would make it more preferred. Again, I would say wait would be a better option there because it's only a single router with two, two exit points. And we're going to AS path prepend 65002 two times for routes that we receive directly from HQ. We're going to assign a, a, a local preference, well, a weight of any value higher than 100 uh, for prefixes that we're receiving from RC2. Remember, prefixes that we originate 32768. By default, prefixes that are originated from another AS are going to have a weight of zero. So we, as long as we assign a higher weight value, it's the same concept as local preference. It's going to be more preferred. We're going to do an AS path prepend of one, two, three, four twice for routes that are learned directly from RC2 over to HQ. In the European Regional Center, we're going to do an AS path prepend, prepend for local prefixes with 65003 two times when we're sending it to Asia, just to make sure that Asia uses the HQ location to get to the European prefixes and vice versa. On the Asia side, we're going to prepend 65004 two times when we're sending the routes to Europe because we don't want that 100 meg link to be the primary link in our, in our routing process. All right. Uh, and then finally, the default routing, we're going to set the local preference for the default route to 80 um, for uh, the uh, default route that's being learned by ISP1. We're going to set the local preference to 90 for the uh, default route that's being learned by ISP, uh, by the ISP from Asia. Keep in mind, the default local preference is 100, which means that the default uh, route that we're receiving from ISP3 would have that local preference of 100, which means that we would have three options to reach that destination, that default route. But the first option would be our local service provider. The second option would be the 100 meg link to the other regional center in Asia. And the third option would be the uh, link over to the headquarters location. We would do the same thing in Asia, 80 for headquarters, 90 for Europe, and then 100 for the local. And then in the main headquarters, we would set a local preference of 200 for the default route that we're learning from ISP1. And we would leave the, the uh, local preference to the default value for ISP2. And we would set the default route for Europe to 90 and the default route for, uh, or the, excuse me, the local preference for the default route to Europe to 90 and the local preference for the default route to Asia to 80. Make sense? So that's, uh, in essence, what we would do. Now, how we do that with the command line configuration and whatnot, well, that just depends on, you know, well, that's, that's how we would have to implement it. We'd have to set up the framework for all of this uh, and uh, do the configuration, but uh, that's not the point of this class, as I've mentioned many times before. All right, so we're going to wrap up this, this, this uh, design case study. We're going to now get into section number eight, which is another design case study where we're going to talk about uh, enterprise campus land design.